What I want to start with, I just want to start with like your, your origin story. I mean, we, I know that you basically did something that was completely impossible, which is you opened up a practice um, basically having three kids. I mean, I would think that would be the worst time to open a practice, but you, you did it anyway. So like, talk us through that. Yeah. So for me, I had, um, I was dealing with a lot of frustrations in knowing that, okay, the more kids that you have, the more expenses you have, um, the only way I'm going to be able to make more money is if I work more hours or if I get more jobs. Um, so I started to look at, well, like, how can I have more family time, but also, um, you know, have enough money to support my family. And there was nothing I could think of besides maybe starting my own practice. And I knew that in the beginning it would be more hours and I probably wouldn't be making much money, but I was thinking like long-term I'll have Mm -hmm. more time with the kids and I'll be able to make more money. And just, this was kind of the only thing that I could see working for my family. Um, Why not just go the director route and just, you know, become a clinic director somewhere or try to work your way up the the ladder. Actually, I remember something that you said, I think it was, I think it was you in your talk about the corporate Jacobs ladder. Was that you who said that? I I did a post on that that evening actually at SSPT. um, Because I thought that was so true is this notion that we all think that we're on a corporate, we're on some sort of like ladder moving upwards, but it's like a, I don't know those, those, those of you guys who know what a Jacob's ladder is, it's that damn exercise thing like a treadmill, but it just doesn't go anywhere and you're on a ladder. And, and can you, could you talk on that? Cause that yeah. shit was funny. <laughs> so, no, so um, for me, like I, corporate ladders are good if you know where you're going, right? So if you have a goal in mind, okay, well, I want to be the director of this clinic. Let me work on this corporate ladder. But, you know, you work really hard in school. And what happened with, with me is I was working really, really hard my whole life to get into PT school. I got into PT school. I worked really, really hard. And so I was used to that sort of intensity of things. So I got out of PT school and I was like, yes, now what? And the place that I was working for was like, well, like, this is what you do a career ladder. And I was like, Oh my God, awesome. So I started climbing the career ladder and taking all these extra courses and trying to get clinical specialists, advanced clinical specialists, all this stuff. I took a supervisor role. Cause I was like, Oh my God, that's going to be good for my career ladder. But I never like sat down to think, well, why am I on this career ladder? What's the end goal for me? I was just working hard for the mere fact of like working hard. And I really didn't need to be doing that. Um, so I think if you're using a career ladder or if you're on a career ladder, just making sure that you know what the end game is and what you're trying to do with it so that you're not just wasting energy. Um, because a career but for you, it wasn't right. What's that? But for you, it wasn't right. I mean, like to, to get on that no, career ladder, I mean, no. you decided, you decided to do something that was way, I think way harder, which is going on your own. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was the reason to go on my own, which was much a a much greater reason, you know, um, for me, again, I wanted that family time and, um, I wanted to be able to support my kids and be there for them. So that was kind of the main reason I was nine months pregnant when I was toying back and forth with this reason of, should I do it? Should I not do it? I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old at home with me. Um, and it was kind of like, uh, it's all or nothing. And so right after I had my son, my third child, um, literally like, I think it was three weeks later, maybe I ended up signing the lease and just saying, all right, well, I'm all in, let's do this and started um, working really hard. And then within a couple months was able to open my practice. Um, Now, what did you start with? Did you, did you move right into the facility that you're in now or did you start something smaller first? No, we actually, or we, I say we, it was me. Um, I (laughs) I don't know. I I started in a small, like 1200 square foot space, which was great. Okay. Um, You know, I was there for two years I found the space because it was um, exactly, you know, you did, you, I did my geographical like assessment of where does there need to be a clinic? Where do I want to work? You know, all of that stuff. Found the perfect location. I found a lease that was going to do a year to year lease, which was like perfect because less risk. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And I had my like three year business plan um, and went into that space and, and within, or I would say less than a year of being in that space, my three year business plan got squashed right into that first year and we just accelerated everything. How did you do that? How did we do that? Um, you know, I think the preparation ahead of time to, um, make sure that we were, you know, 
ticking all the boxes, crossing the T's, dotting the I's. I mm -hmm. like immersed myself within the community. Um, I figured, how did you do that? You know, it's go big or go home. How did I do that? I, I started, I joined all the networking groups, the business associations. Mm -hmm. I started supporting sports teams. I was going to sports camps and doing free talks. Um, I did a podcast, which is on like a, has been on a pause for about a year, but I did a podcast, which was called the health and fit fitness connector podcast. And basically I interviewed local, um, people, fitness people, doctors, chiros, everything just to talk about their business and what they do and how that ties into like general health and stuff. So I started mm. kind of making sure everyone knew who I was, but also supporting them in their businesses. Um, now take me, take, take me through that. Cause that's super interesting. So yeah. you st essentially started a podcast called the PT connector podcast. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Or health, the health, and, with health and fitness connector, health and fitness connector. Um, and it was a local, it was a local endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. You interviewed people locally yeah. that were in your industry mm -hmm. because there's no doubt, like when you interview somebody, there's a relationship that gets developed. Right. And so you use that as leverage in a sense to develop relationships with people that were local to you yep. that positioned you as an expert. It positioned them as an expert exactly. and to develop that relationship right off the bat. That is something I have not done. And that is an absolutely brilliant idea. So any of you guys who are listening who are starting your own practice, and you're trying to figure out how are you going to get yourself, you know, in front of the right people in your town and your area, there's no doubt that going to them and sucking up and trying to buy them lunch is a horrible, horrible way yeah. to do it. Yeah. And one amazing way to do it is what, what, what Kelly just explained, which is just doing a podcast and having them on as your guest and, and talking about what they do. And then yeah. that, that led to some good relationships. Right. That's, that's and pretty it, awesome. And it doesn't happen right away either. That's the thing. And just over time, even now I'm getting people that are like, Oh yeah, you were, you know, I know so-and-so who was on the podcast with you, but putting in the work ahead of time and not expecting immediate results and knowing that, um, you know, you're going to be, it, it takes a lot to kind of promote the pot. I mean, you have a podcast, you know, it takes a lot to promote the po podcast, prepare, edit, all of that stuff. And all of that was brand new to me. So I was putting in a lot of time, um, for other people and kind of just promoting that. And on the podcast, I didn't even talk about my business. It was just mm -hmm. all the podcast and all their business. Um, so it was, it was putting in a lot of work up front so that, you know, down the line it would help out. And it did, which was great. Um, you know, How I'm sure there were some things that I did you... that didn't work out too, but you know. Right. That's fine. How far in advance before you opened your practice did you start the process of creating relationships? Ugh. Um, that's funny because I, did you say podcast or the business? Oh, sorry. I think I said business. How far in advance of, of opening your business did you start developing relationships? Uh, you know, I think as a PT, so I had been treating for six years or so. So I had some relationships with other therapists, mostly a couple doctors, but nothing like great. Um, I think if I had known that I was going to have such a passion and such a, such a drive to do that, I might've worked a lot harder had I known what was coming down the line. But since mm -hmm. it was really just this like spark of, of final kind of like frustration and like, nope, I'm doing this, going big, I really didn't have much preparation. I looked into it a little bit so towards the end of my pregnancy and started looking at, you know, potential leases and stuff. But I still was on that fence of like, do I do it or do I not do it? Um, and so, so what was the tipping point? Like where, you know, there's that, there's that, there's, I first that book blink. I think it's blink. Where like, you know, you, 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 you contemplate, you contemplate, you contemplate, but then the actual decision to decide, which, you know, if you've heard, I'm sure the people talk about that word before, meaning mm -hmm. you just, the word decide means to cut or to sever. Right. So at some point in time, you actually decide to do something. Yeah. And what was that moment for you? I don't, you know, I don't know. It, it really, I think all cumul cumulated, I can't even say, I can't even talk right now. You've got me all thrown off. I'm looking at Again, it's talk. just because you're from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's the problem. No, so I would say it was definitely with, with having my son and, and just knowing that I want. Which one? Two or three? Well, number three. It was number okay. three. It was, that was like the final, that was it. It was like, okay, I want more time with my kids. They're young. They're going to get old quick. I know that everybody and their mother tells you that like, you know, mm -hmm. like, Oh yeah, they're going to go, you know, and it, it flies by. Um, and I didn't want to miss it all just by working, you know, 50, 60 hours a week or whatever I was going to have to do. Um, and I, that's all I could see myself doing. But I, I thought, well, if I open my own clinic, yeah, I might, be working crazy hours for a year or two or however long it ended up taking. Um, 
you know, and taking a hit on my salary for a little while, but the end result was going to be so much more than what I was ever going to get as a manager or a director or anything like that, that it was like, right. you know, kind of with each child, I would say I had a little spark of like, Oh, I need more family time. Oh, I need more family time. <laughs> Um, without being able to take a financial hit. And I would say with my third child, it was just this like explosion of like, oh my God, this is the only thing I can do in order to get this. Yeah. Now you started in a small space Mm -hmm. and how long did it take you to essentially get busy, if you will? So we, we officially opened in May because we had to do a build out and everything on the, on the new location. Did you pay for that or did the landlord pay for the build out? uh, It was... I paid for most of it. It was like a did, small yeah. build out. Yeah. But they paid for, I think painting and new carpet and stuff like that. But so, um, we did the build out. So then we opened and everybody was like, okay, prepare yourself to have this really slow build up. Like make sure you have another per diem job just in case. And I had three little kids. So I was like, well, I'll just, I'll watch my kids more and we'll send them to daycare less. Like if it's a slow build up which I was fully prepared for this real Mm -hmm. slow sloth like buildup. And in September, so we opened in May by September, I was like, Oh my God, I need another PT because I can't handle all these visits. Um, And I like was not prepared for that at all. Um, You know, my big thing and the biggest mistake that we, or I did with my business was I constantly prepared for failure. Um, Mm. I planned for every possible failure that could happen and I hadn't prepared for success. So when success okay. happened just a few months in, I was like, oh my God, what do I do now? I can't find anybody. And it took me a couple months to find a PT. And then, mm. so by the time we turned one year, it was clear that um, I was going to need a bigger space. It was clear that I accelerated my business plan. Um, you know, I thought I'd be in that space for three years. And within one year, it was like, I need a bigger space. Wow. Um, yeah. So at the one year anniversary, it all kind of like, came together and was like, okay, like you're looking at this from the wrong angle. Like we need to plan for every possible success and not necessarily every possible failure, which is where I was kind of living in my business of just like planning for failure. That's a really interesting mindset shift. Yeah. To, yeah. To, I mean, to like, it's so easy, I think for our brains to default to what if this doesn't work? What if it doesn't succeed? And all the fear, like the fear is so present. It just drives all those thoughts about what, but then, but then you're right. I mean, what about the other side of it is if it succeeds, what what do you do? And especially when you're opening a practice, I mean, so you're, you opened an in-network practice, right? Yes. Is that right? And that's still, that's still the way the practice is today. Yes. Yep. Yeah. We've got some percentage of cash, but mostly insurance. Right. And uh, you know, it, the, the trend these days, of course, is, is the cash-based practice. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I've spoken to another different, number of different cash-based owners uh, who are really, really struggling to, to build their practice. And, you know, it's a very, it's a risky model in many ways because what happens during the next financial crisis, which is imminent, mm-hmm. and people necessarily, you know, a lot of people are going to maybe change their spending habits a little bit. So the, the, the insurance-based practice is definitely not dead. And, and yeah. you know, your clinic is proof of that. Greg Todd's clinic is proof of that. Um, you know, we have a mixed uh, hybrid practice here. So I think that's, that's, that's interesting is that you, you essentially, you did something that you thought was impossible and then the impossible came true and you were like, oh shit, <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> and you pivoted and you opened up a bigger space. Yeah. So what was that transition like going from a smaller space to a bigger space? You had to buy new stuff. You had to hire new mm. people. Like how did it you was, do that? It was uh, terrifyingly exciting, right? So it was like, okay, you know, I was kind of going back and forth. I was looking at a bunch of other um, clinics and, and locations and stuff. And I found this perfect location, but it was drastically different from what we were doing. It was a 4,500 okay. square foot sort of factory style open, um, space, but walking I in saw the picture, that it first, looks a little, almost like a CrossFit type space where it's yes, very open. Yeah, yeah. All open. The front was like finished, like looked like a waiting area. And we ended up adding some private treatment rooms in the front but then you walk in the back and it's just this massive open space. And so walking in that first, the first instinct was it's way too big. And then by the time I, I wasn't even in the parking lot and I was like, Oh my God, it's perfect. Like I have to be there. And so all of kind of the planning for it happened around like, okay, that's the perfect space. 
I know who I want to support. It's my youth athletes. I know the team that I need. So I started building that team and just kind of jamming ourselves into that 1200 square foot space and scaling as best we could while we were there, continuing to promote all of what we were about to become as well as currently what we were. Um, and it was a lot of, to be honest, it was a lot of faith and I have an amazing, amazing team that, um, you know, supported me through this and all the while, like, you know, it, it was my dream, but it was also everyone else's of like, what do we want out of this? And are we ready for this? And I just, you know, I don't know how many times I had said to them, like, I feel like we're about to jump off a cliff. I need to make sure everyone's jumping with me and I'm not the only idiot. Like, yeah. <laughs> here we go. like, are we in this? Because I'm not signing this new lease until like, you know, we're like blood brothers right now. Everybody slight, you know, give a little blood, put it in like the whole thing. It was like, okay, we all doing this. Um, and so I, we, I had the support of, you know, my entire team and then the community as well kind of saw what we were doing. And so it was good to see so much support and to go in and, um, just plan for, again, just planning for success and all of that was mm. definitely a major awesome. mindset shift because that was not how I had currently been a thinker. Right. But you know, you said something interesting about that, you know, you not only did not only did you have a team with you, but you 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 enrolled them in the concept and the vision that you had for yourself, and you made sure that they were all on board. Mm -hmm. And and in doing so, you felt like you guys you know were all jumping together, which I think is a kind of a really neat visual. You know, when you think about going into business, it does feel like a, a leap mm -hmm. in many ways. And when you're going into an even bigger business, it feels like a bigger leap, and yeah. it never stops. It never stops feeling like that. Every venture I take on feels like that. Yeah. And uh, to have that team around you is, is awesome. So yeah. I want to switch gears a little bit. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, female listeners and there's a lot of moms listening. And a lot of them are probably thinking, how the hell does she do it? So I want you to walk us through, if you don't mind, not too personal, I hope, a day in the life uh, of Kelly. Yeah, so... Um, I would say every day is a little different, but obviously I'm at home in the morning. Um, you have a morning routine that you go through? Yep. So it's, I mean, anybody that has kids, um, understands it's just chaos. There's no like, oh yes. And at <laughs> seven fifteen, this is what happened. It's just, it's <laughs> chaos till we're all out the door. There's bags flying, there's diapers flying, wipes, food, um, everything, brush your teeth. You know, there's usually at least one kid that escaped the house without brushing their teeth, but this is, <laughs> this is the life I'm living. So uh -huh. it's, it's just chaos till we get out the door um and then a couple days so it's different because um a couple days a week my parents watch them um, my in-laws watch them one day and two days a week they go to daycare my daughter is now in kindergarten so that's the whole bus we wait for the bus out front till the bus comes um so i would say that by most days all the kids are out of the house by nine o'clock um so you know my, i'm married so my husband some days like if i have to be at the office early he'll do that whole routine with the kids um, okay. you know, but I'm at a point in the business now where most days I can be here up until nine o'clock. Um, in the beginning, it was consistently at least two to three days of the week. I was gone pretty early. So my husband mm. was handling all of that. So I'm lucky that, that we tough. have so much support. Um, and I don't know that we could have, um, grown the business and done what we did without the support that I have. Um, you know, I think I make that very clear. It's not, I'm not doing this on my own. I have, um, you know, my husband who's great. Um, and I have family, but you know, my husband isn't always here. Like he travels for work as well. So it's just, mm. there's no like system that we have set that it's just, this is what we do every day. It's usually everybody's out by nine. I'm at the office. Um, I'm putting out fires cause my, my business is three. We don't have all like these perfect systems in place. We're still working mm -hmm. on it. We're still, um, you know, trying to nail all that down. I do treat still, so not every day, but I would say between five and 15 patients a week I'm treating. So I might have okay. some patients at the office. If not, I'm going over marketing or productivity or trying to figure out the wait list and just kind of the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Um, right. and then trying to plan for the future of the business. Um, who's your go-to person in your business? Who's the person that you work with most in terms of like, like the, the team member that you rely on the most to have a private practice work properly? Yeah. Uh, an office manager for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
which is funny because we really just hired like our first full-time office manager in February. Mm -hmm. Before that, um, the people that I have that were um, the office managers and code of practice coordinators were all part-time. So between 25 and 32 hours a week, which is difficult. So I was doing a lot more of it um, until February when I was able to bring it on this full-time um, practice manager. So it must have been a relief. <laughs> a major, major relief. I mean, it was it was a long time coming. It, it was, um, you know, I had kept re- kept reaching out to this person and say like, I really want to bring you on. Um, and finally, we were able to do that in February. So it's been great. It's been extremely helpful. Um, still learning and transitioning there. You know, there's still fires that I'm putting out. We use an EMR system. So for us, I can work from home. If I don't have actual patients, I can do work from mm-hmm. home, um, which I'm doing for part of the day today. Um, you know, I can check on the schedule. I can message with all my therapists on this, the HIPAA secure EMR system and um, get it done from there. And then, you know, if I'm seeing patients in the afternoon, I would be at work. If I'm not seeing patients, then it's daycare pickups, um, getting the kids off the bus and then, do, you know, doing our family time thing. So if my daughter's good dance or the kids have soccer yeah. or whatever it is, dinner, tubs, bedtime, which hopefully is like, doesn't last more than an hour, but it's, I mean, if you have kids, it's who knows what happens. So it sounds to me like the big, the biggest shift that you made right? Yeah. to get that family time and correct me if I'm wrong, because I know a lot of, a lot of clinicians are thinking, should I open my own practice? Should I do cash pay? Mm-hmm. But I, it sounds to me that what made it possible for you mm-hmm. is that you're not treating that much. Yeah. And that because you're not treating, you don't have as many notes and you get to make your own hours and you don't, you don't have to rely on being inside the practice every day to make money. Other people are making you money. And by opening up a practice set up like that, Mm -hmm. where it's not just you delivering care, that essentially is what enabled you to do what to sort of fulfill your mission right now, which was family time. Exactly. And so if I'm sick, I'm not canceling a ton of patients. Or if I have a kid that's sick, I'm not canceling a ton of patients. That was the only way it was. If I had done cash, it would have been that one-on-one time for so much longer um, that I don't think I ever would have been able to do this. So um, it is great. If I don't have patients, I don't have notes at night. I usually do work at night. I'll do some computer work, whatever, once the kids are in bed. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so nine o'clock to whenever is when I'll work on other business stuff. But like, I love working on the business. I find this stuff fun. I really like, you know, the creative and the business part of it. Um, so for me, it's like fun to do all this stuff. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's fun, you know, you try and leave the stress out of it. Obviously there are some things that are really stressful. Um, but you know, mostly it's just, it's fun and it's exciting. That's awesome. So what are, what are probably some of like your, your favorite hacks now for bringing new people in? What do you rely on marketing strategy wise that just works for you that, you know, if you need some new patients, that's your sort of go-to? Yeah. So we use an email marketing campaign. So to previous patients, you know, at this point we've got over, I think 600 emails of previous patients that those are the people that have just submitted emails um, so that we can. So we'll reach out to them you know, try and get some old patients back in or just let them know, hey, you know, if you know anybody that needs PT, that'll usually kick up quite a few referrals. Okay. Um, what does that email sound like? It's usually just filling them in on the business and where the business is at. And, you know, okay. it's been a slow winter or what, you know, whatever, and just being extremely honest. I think from the start, I've been very honest with the community in terms of what I'm trying to build, what I need help with and what I can help them with. Um, so I think people appreciate that. Um, in healthcare today, I think it's all this like downsizing and like squeezing every little dollar out of every little thing. You know, they call it like lean healthcare. And you mm-hmm. see it at like um, grocery stores and Lowe's and Home Depot where they're getting rid of cashiers and they're putting a computer in their place. Um, right. That's happening in healthcare too. And did you hear about this one, this one practice that has a digital front desk? So you walk in and I think I heard this from Jerry Durham and, and, uh, the, essentially the receptionist is a computer screen and you literally walk in and it's a virtual receptionist. It's, it's someone who's at their home oh. and you like talk to the person in the computer screen <laughs> to get yourself checked in, which I thought was an amazing way to save money, but I would never ever want to do something like that yeah, so <laughs> in it's, my practice. Cause it's so dissociated. It is a nice way to save money, but, um, you know, as people's co-pays and deductibles and, and insurance costs are rising, they're paying attention more to like the experience of what they're getting mm-hmm. out of their PT. 
So, I mean, you go to any PT clinic, everybody's good. I mean, every now and then you get a bad PT, but for the most part, everybody's really, really good in their own way. Um, so the thing that has to make you stand out is not necessarily your clinicians, but it's the experience that they have at your clinic. So we're mm -hmm. really focused on making sure and it's what we call the relieved healthcare consumer method, but making sure we're taking people from frustration Pause. Say that again. I like that. Just drop that one more time. Say it again. The relieved healthcare consumer method. Um, so All right. Walk us through that because that sounds awesome. Yeah. I just like the sound of that. I feel like the, the word relieved yeah. healthcare consumer method is exactly what I want to feel when I walk into a doctor's office and it's like immediately that stress of all the forms and the shit and the people you don't yeah. understand it and you don't have your card and all this stuff. And you are sort of like creating a method yeah. to almost address that. So walk us through that. So it's it's something I was able to create through um, actually Greg Todd's program. So like, you know, everybody has like these, these methods or these programs that they do for their avatar. Well, I wanted my sort of avatar to be like everybody who's frustrated with healthcare right now. So my whole point was taking people from annoyed and frustrated with their healthcare experience to feeling like relieved and oh my god this clinic is taking care of me and has my back mm. start to finish because you don't see that anymore right like that's rare in healthcare you call even my pediatrician i call the pediatrician someone angry answers the phone and then puts me on hold for 20 minutes um, and that does nothing and now we know and it's research backed that patients with chronic pain um, can start to feel better just by the tone that you have in their in your voice when you talk to them and my front mm -hmm. desk workers can start to help someone's pain just by how they talk to someone and how they interact with them on the phone. So we've explained to everybody that works in the business from the front desk worker to the aide to the therapist, their role in helping someone feel better, um, not only pain wise, but just emotionally and, you know, just feeling drained from going through like the healthcare system in the process right now. Um, so that relieved healthcare consumer method, we talk about all the different touch points we might have with a patient, phone call, email, face to face, um, whether they're a potential patient, current patient, former patient, uncle of a brother's sister's patient, whatever, and how we can take care of them and make them feel um, like we're, we're listening and we understand what they're going to, through and how can we make this entire experience easier for them. Um, mm. so like I was saying, that's important because people are paying attention to how they're being treated now. Um, you know, you can get therapy anywhere. So if somebody's paying $70 for a copay, they're going to go to the place that makes them feel good start to finish, not to the place that has the best person with the best manual skills. Cause you can, for those of you that are listening, raise your hand right now. If you would go to PTU Kelly's clinic right now, <laughs> right? Cause I would like, if I lived in your hometown and that was the Thank attitude you. of the practice. I would absolutely, that's where I would want to go because I would feel like taken care of. I would feel relieved. And I think that focusing on, so you, we talked about a couple things. The, the first one you said was honesty, which I think is super important. And focusing on the customer experience and what it is and how you'd want to be taken care of, I think is, is so crucial. Are there any other, any other marketing strategies that you want to drop on uh, Drop on our listeners to let them, you know, give them some ideas about ways in which they can they can market for themselves yeah. other than other than going to past patients. Yeah, setting yourself as up as an expert is always important and you you know, doing that through social media, which is for the most part is free. Um, I think any time that we're again slow, we're trying that email marketing campaign, but we're also, you know, I might throw up an ad on Facebook um, and just put it out there. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, my, my front desk manager is like, Hey, take that ad down because we can't get all these people in. Um, so it's wow. surprising once you have people Wait, so that, hold on, what's the ad? <laughs> any what, ad. Is, what did you do? <laughs> once, once people understand what you're trying to do, they want to help you too. They want to help make you mm -hmm. a success. So people see an ad former patients, um, you know, and they might be like, Oh my God. And they'll tag a friend or two in it and say, Hey, you know, they right. need patients. I know you were looking because people just want to help other people out and especially, you know, I think that's true in healthcare right now is because people are seeing these sort of conglomerates like take over. And so when you're a small business, like mom and pop shop, people want to support you, which is great. Right. So that's ask awesome. for help because people want to support you. You know, you don't want to drown, yeah, so you know, just not saying anything. And all of a sudden you're like, Oh yeah. Okay. We fizzled out. Like, no, let people yep. know. 
honesty and uh, being up front is what I'm hearing, which is, which is really crucial. So we're coming to the end here, but you know, if, if anybody wants to get in touch with you or has a question, and uh, maybe there's a mom out there that has some kids that's scared to take the leap, um, how would people get in touch with you? They can email me, uh, ptuclinic at gmail.com, or they can find me on Facebook or Instagram, same thing, PTU Clinic, at PTU Clinic, or Kelly Duggan on phys- uh, Facebook. Um, and they can just reach out to me. I, you know, I do phone calls with people all the time, just kind of little like strategy calls just to um, help them figure out that beginning stage of like, well, how do I actually make this work? I think it's important that if you're thinking of doing something like this, you find someone that's doing what you want to do that has a life similar to yours. So if you're mm-hmm. a new parent or want to be a new parent, but you also want to do this venture, talk to other parents that are out there that are doing it so they can give you kind of like the down and dirty and like this is what it's really going to be like. It's totally doable, but just so that you're prepared in all aspects. Great advice. Kelly, Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks for having me.